so I skipped a slide. We'll come back to that slide later on. Um, I want to think again about uh, solubility equilibriums. We've looked at this a couple of times now, but it's essentially you put the solid on the left and the aqueous ions on the right. And there's actually really good reasons for that. It's going to make our math simpler later. So keep doing it this way. Solid's always uh, the reactant. But also in practice, um, that's what you do. You take the solid and put it into the water and then you get the ions, right? So um, we're going to look at the simulation again and try to understand. Well, actually, we've seen it twice. I think you can visualize it, I hope, by now. But if not, you can actually go click on the link yourself in the beginning of this lecture notes and, and look at it if you'd like to. So if, for instance, I am doing the qual scheme and I want to isolate as much silver precipitate as I can, I need to manipulate this reaction to do that. Um, so this is what we want to get, which means I have to decrease the total amount of Ag plus that's in the solution. So the way, the best way to do that is to increase the amount of bromide. In our case in lab, we used iod, uh, no, we used chloride because it's um, more stable and it's less dangerous. Bromine, bromine is super not good for you. Um, but if you increase the amount of the halogen, it's going to cause a excess product so the reaction shifts to the left, right? So this rate going backward gets faster for a little while, which means I'm going to get more of the product to form. The concentration of the silver ion is actually going to go down, but our total concentration of product altogether goes up. So it's a little bit confusing. Also, AGBR goes up too, okay? So we're shifting to make more reactant to compensate for having so much extra product. That's why you did that thing where it says to test for complete precipitation by adding an extra drop of HCl. It's really the Cl minus that does that, right? So you're sh making sure that it's shifted as far left as it can go. All right, and so the disturbance is increasing the amount of bromide in this case, or chloride in the lab. The equilibrium has to shift to the left to compensate for that because we have to consume those extra products. If that's true, we're making more AGBR, so that means the mass increases. And again, just to summarize, shift to the left, or sometimes people say shift towards reactants. I don't really mind whichever one you feel more comfortable with. Sometimes left and right is confusing. So if you want to stay towards reactants, that's fine with me. All right, and so that's one example. Here's another one. You guys are going to do these um, in lab, actually. Uh, so it might be a good idea to take some good notes about this. But these videos were made by um, Tim Thomas, who is the, an associate vice president in the college now, but he, he and his students made these a few years ago, and it's a really good illustration. The first thing we have to be able to do is we have to know the names of these chemicals. So I'm just going to label them. Um, CrO42- minus is the chromate. I know that's yellow. It's hard to see. I'll trace over it again in black, but um, that's the color of it, actually. It's a bright, bright yellow color. It's going to look like a bumblebee, right? But so chromate is yellow. You guys have used a bunch of chromate in this, um, in this lab, right? So potassium chromate to show the presence of lead twice. Um, but that's what chromate is. Dichromate is called di because it has two chromiums in it. These are polyatomic ions. They are not actually... Um, they're covalent bonds. They're not ionic because their electronegativity differences is not big enough. So these are going to stay the way they are, you know, as a polyatomic. But whenever you have chromate or dichromate, you actually have an equilibrium. Okay. So that K2CrO4 that you were using isn't just chromate and potassium. It's also got some dichromate in there and also some hydrogen ions. So in the first equilibrium position, we have this image, I'm going to move myself, 
There we go. We have this image of the test tube on the particle level where there's a few orange chrome dichromates in there, but mostly it's chromate, which means yellow solution. So a chemistry student adds hydrochloric acid to the equilibrium. Pause the video and make a prediction so you can test your understanding. Okay, I don't know what you predicted, but we're gonna watch what happens and you're gonna record exactly, um, keep your prediction, don't erase it guys. That's how science works, okay? Keep your prediction and then we'll see if you're right or wrong. You'll get another chance, don't worry, it's no big deal. So here's our chromate solution, as you can see, quite yellow. A student adds hydrochloric acid and it turns orange. So what we just observed, so the cause of the disruption was adding hydrochloric acid. So you could see that, that's accurate, but it's not the whole truth because really the, it, the Cl minus doesn't do anything. And I know that because it's not part of my chemical reaction here. I have chromate, I have hydrogen ion, I have dichromate and I have water. The only part of that reaction that we were actually adding is the H plus. Where's my cursor? Oh, I gotta change the color. Right, so H plus changing is, in this case, increasing, is the cause of the disturbance. So we added more reactant. We just said, if you have too much reactant, it will automatically shift forward or right to make more product. That's what we observe. So when it when the rate forward becomes faster for a bit, that means we're going to make some of the orange stuff, the dichromate, and that's why the solution turns orange. Okay. So hopefully you predicted that, but if not, it's okay. Now we're going to do another one. So new equilibrium position. We're starting mostly with dichromate, and the disturbance is different. We're adding sodium hydroxide. Now we look in here and we know, we know that sodium hydroxide is gonna break up. It's a strong base, so it's always gonna ionize. We know it's gonna do that. So the question is, which of these is going to be participating in our equilibrium? And we look at this and it turns out that none of them do. There's no Na plus, there's no OH minus. So what happens? I have a little question here that might help you figure it out. What is the OH minus gonna react with? So that's a charge question, right? And so we have a, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see this, I'll make it a little easier. Um, we have a, we have a two minus charge on the dichromate and a two minus, oh, well, so dichromate is over here, two minus charge on dichromate and a two minus charge on chromate. That is not gonna be attracted to that hydroxide. So not gonna react, opposites attract, right? Um, the water is not charged, so it's less likely to react with the hydroxide. Uh, but the hydrogen ion is charged. So it's a pretty good bet that that hydrogen ion is able to react with the hydroxide. We called this an acid-base neutralization in chapter four. We studied it in two different experiments. We studied it um, in the titration virtual experiment you probably did, um, or if you're lucky, the actual titration experiment. Uh, and you also studied acid-base neutralizations in the heat of reaction labs. So we reacted a couple of different acids with NaOH. And in all the cases, the heats are the same. That's because the reaction is the same. The net ionic equation ends up looking like this, right? So. Hydrogen ion, that's a plus. Hydrogen ion is gonna react with the hydroxide. They like hanging out together because they have opposite charges. So when we do that, we look at this and we're saying, okay, well, I am decreasing the amount of hydrogen ion because I'm reacting it. That's the disruption. We're decreasing it because it's being reacted. Um, so now I ask myself, which way is this reaction going to shift as a result of that disruption? 
Which one do I have too much of and which one do I have not enough of? Pause the video and make your prediction. Okay, so we're gonna watch the video and we're gonna see what happens. Is this video in a video? Uh, let's go back, let's go back. Okay, so orange to start with. Then we're gonna add the NaOH in a pipette. And it turns super yellow. Okay, so we went from having a lot of dichromate to having a lot of chromate. So this decreased, this increases. That means the reaction had to shift to the left. That's because we didn't have enough reactant, right? We took some of the reactant away, so it had to replace it. I hope that your prediction was right, um, but if not, it's okay. You're gonna have more opportunities, lots of them in the lab to work with this. But understanding that when we remove something, nature will shift to compensate for that. When we add something extra, like in the last example, it will also compensate for that, it will use it up. 